Welcome to our fourth lecture on the topic of prejudice. We're going to consider one of the most famous studies in social psychology, the minimal group studies. And this, these studies act as the foundation for social identity theory, which is probably the most influential theory in our discipline in the past 30, 40 years. The minimal group studies were conducted by Henri Tarshfell. He worked as in, at Bristol University. He wanted to know whether the causes of group conflict, and that's things like ethnocentrism, which is in-group bias, discrimination, prejudice, can they exist in the absence of hostility between groups, a history of hostility? Can they exist in the absence of authoritarian personalities? Can they exist in the absence of competition? for scarce resources. You'll recall that uh, Sharif study had argued that competition was necessary, uh, was a sufficient condition for conflict, but was competition necessary? Was it possible for there to be conflict between groups without competition, without any hostility, without any authoritarians? And so that's how he designed, why he designed the minimal group study. The study was comprised of 12-year-old boys, schoolboys from Bristol, and they were called into the study and then they were shown a series of pictures, paintings, and they were asked to indicate which painting they preferred, a painting by Paul Klee or a painting by Vasily Kandinsky. Now, the important thing to bear in mind here is that modern art is of very little interest to 12 year old boys. So these are categories. They're, they were going to be assigned into groups of Klee group or the Kandinsky group, but these are really meaningless groups. It's the same, they did replications of this where they flipped a coin and they assigned the subject into a heads group or a tails group. These groups, these categories have very little meaning. There's no history of conflict between the heads group and the tails group or the key group and the Kandinsky group. That's why it's called minimal group studies. The, the, there are minimal criteria for uh, groupness. So what is the definition of minimal groups? Well, the groups have no history. They are created from scratch. These boys are called in, shown these pictures, they make a decision, they are assigned into these groups. In actual fact, the, the researchers assigned them randomly into the groups, although they believed they were in the key group or the Kondinsky group. So the criterion of, of uh, assignment into the groups was arbitrary and there's no contact. They didn't know the other members of the group. So in fact, what they were done, what, what the experimenters did is they put each of the subjects into a private cube so they were assigned into the group and then they went into a private cubicle where they had to make an allocation and we'll talk about that just now. But this group is a rather strange group because it's not a group like the group we know, university students, uh, South African citizens, uh, Peter Marisburg citizens, people that go to this church, etc, etc, etc. These are not real groups, they are minimal groups. And so what Tajfell and Turner were trying to do is they tried to redefine and they, tried, they developed a cognitive redefinition of the group where they weren't interested in the individual in a group, this class, 2 to 3 class or a class in social psychology, there's an individual in the classroom. They were rather interested in the group in the individual, just the idea that you're in a group. The group has no reality for you. You've never met any other members of that group. It's got no history. It's just the idea that you're in a group. What effect can that idea have? And can just the idea that you're in a group be enough to cause ethnocentrism, in-group bias, conflict, prejudice, discrimination, etc.? So in the experiment, yeah, these boys were assigned into these groups, then they were put into a private cubicle, and then they were presented with um, a matrix, a series of matrices like this, in which they had to assign monetary value to either an in-group or an out-group member. And this monetary value, they never assigned it to themselves. So there was never their own greed or their own desire for money in there. They just had to make the decision between how much should an in-group member get or how much should an out-group member get. And it could have varied between on the one side you see of, of this um, matrix over here, on the right hand side, 19 or 25 pennies. 
So an in-group member gets 19 pennies and an out-group member gets 25 pennies. Or it could have been in the middle over here where both the in-group and out-group member get the same, but then they only get 13. Or on the one side, on the other extreme over here, the, the in-group member gets seven and the out-group member gets one. Now, what do you think people would prefer? Would you prefer to get seven rand or seven uh, cents or would you prefer to get 19? So in terms of resources, people would prefer to get the, the most amount of those resources, in other words, the 19 as opposed to the seven. But when you put it in the context of a decision between an in-group and out-group member, what they found was that, what the distribution strategies that were chosen is that the, the, the most prominent or the most powerful force was in-group favoritism. People were wanting to make sure that their group got more than the out-group. In fact, one of the strategies that was most commonly chosen was maximum difference, like the one versus seven, the maximum difference between the in-group and the out-group. Although there was also a tendency to choose the fairness. But what there wasn't a tendency to do was to take lots of money for the in-group, the 19 versus 25, where the out-group had even more. So this uh, experiment very powerfully demonstrated that group members are prepared to forgo material resources very in, in, in direct contrast to Sharif's um, summer camp studies, the realistic group conflict. Tarshul is arguing people don't want realistic benefits, they don't want money, the 19 pennies that they could have, rather they're prepared to take much less, they're prepared to take the seven as long as they get more than the out group. So this study showed that competition didn't need to be over material resources. People were prepared to forgo material resources as long as they were better off than the out group. So how do we explain these results? And so the rest of this lecture and the next lecture is going to deal is going to deal with the explanation. The min, uh, social identity theory developed as an explanation for these results. The first explanation, or the first approach to explanation, is social categorization. Tarshville argued that the only reality of the group that existed for them was a category, just the idea that they were in a Klee group or a Kandinsky group or a heads group or a tails group. So classification of people into groups was a, was a sufficient condition for intergroup conflict. So Tartful argued, drawing from other work in social psychology, that categorization is universal. People categorize all the time. They have to categorize. It is necessary for survival. When you uh, come to travel on the roads, for example, you don't treat each car as an individual. Wow, there's a green one, here's a blue one. Oh, there, look at this one over here, it's got a scratch. No, you just categorize them all as cars. If we had to focus on each one in its own uniqueness, we'd be overwhelmed by the stimulus input we wouldn't be able to just to 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 drive down the road so what we do is we just categorize them we treat them as potentially hazardous and we mind our own business and that's true with with uh, life in general to survive we need to categorize but what Tarshville argues is categorization is the basis of prejudice prejudice consists in treating people of a group all the same just the same as we can treat cats the same versus dogs or cars the same etc categorization therefore is the is the is the foundation of prejudice but categorization has a number of spin-offs has a number of consequences and the important one over here is that categorization produces an accentuation effect once we categorize individuals into groups we tend to overestimate the similarity between people within groups and we tend to overestimate the differences between groups. So categorization has a has a spin-off, has a, a it creates a kind of perceptual distortion in which we accentuate differences between groups and minimize differences within groups. This 
has been shown by a number of experiments. This is just one of the experiments of the accentuation effect. This was done in a Scandinavian country where they showed subjects a picture of a whole lot of people at an airport in Scandinavia. Now, you have to remember to, to understand this experiment that Scandinavians are, are tall, much taller than people on average. And in the first um, version of this experiment, they showed the people in the, in the airport lounge and there were smokers and non-smokers. Now, the important thing that smoking isn't correlated with height. So it's not the case that smokers are taller or shorter than non-smokers. There's no correlation between smoking and height. So when they showed the, the, the subjects the pictures in the airport lounge of the smokers and the non-smokers, then afterwards they took the picture away and said, will you draw the hearts of these people? They got them quite right. It was quite accurate. But in the next version, they said, well, they categorized the people in the airport lounge. These are tourists who are generally shorter than Scandinavians, and here are Scandinavian businessmen. Now they took the picture away and they got the, the subjects to, to draw how tall everyone was. And you can see here on the right hand side, here's the accentuation effect. Here's a kind of sense that there's this, this perceptual distortion in which the participants saw the businessmen as being taller than the, than the tourists. And in the third condition, they, they, they made the distinction, the categorization between here are Japanese and here are Scandinavians. So, and of course, we know the, this, the stereotype that Japanese are short and the, and the, the reality that the, 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 the subjects in Scandinavia knew the Scandinavians at all. They showed them the picture of these, these, these individuals of different heights. Um, and then they took the picture away and asked them to represent it. And you can see this huge uh, accentuation effect, this perceptual distortion. So the cognitive process, so Tarshall argues that underlying prejudice, underlying the, the, the in-group bias that was evident in the minimal group studies is this process, a cognitive process of categorization. As soon as we categorize people into groups, we tend to accentuate the difference between the in-group and the out-group. Whether, we, um, whether those groups are important to us or not, the mere fact of categorization tends to lead to that exaggeration, that um, uh, accentuation effect. But as we're going to see in the next lecture, categorization has another effect because not only do we categorize, it's very different to categorizing cars versus bicycles or cats versus dogs, the social categories we belong to. And so categorization is not only a basis for us to perceive the world, it's also the foundation for us to perceive ourselves. So categorization is also the foundation of social identity. And this is also a very important part of social identity theory, as we'll see in the next lecture.